Good evening, my name is Karen Plant and I'm the president of AI Ohio. Welcome to today's program, Equity and Development, presented by Monica Chada with Civic Projects Architecture. Before we start today's program, I would like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlight on the screen now. Our sponsors have been critical to our ability to bring this innovative and quality programming to our members this year. If you see them, please thank them. I'd also like to thank all of those who made donations to the AI Ohio Foundation as part of the registration process for our lecture series. As you can see on the screen, the foundation has made significant investments in scholarships and to, for architecture students in Ohio and AIS chapters across the state. If you missed the opportunity to donate to the foundation during registration, please consider going to the AI Ohio's website and show your support for the future of our profession. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Our program is scheduled for one and one half hours, including about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. At the end of the program, we'll be looking to the box, chat box, to identify participants who would like to ask questions of the speaker. A link will be placed in the chat box as well towards the end of the presentation. Please follow the link to enter the information, your information member number, so you'll receive learning units for today's program. Finally, I'd like to thank Robert Mashke for selecting the speakers and moderating the design series for AI Ohio this year. Robert is a past president of AI Ohio and the recipient of many awards, including the AI Ohio Gold Medal, the Cleveland Arts Prize for Design, and the AI Ohio Gold Medal Firm, along with national honors from AIA. Thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Robert to introduce our speaker for this evening's program. Robert. Thank you. Monica Chada, AIA Lead AP, is the founder and principal of Civic Projects in Chicago, contributing a background that is equal parts social engagement and quality design. The firm's approach to design is hybrid and participatory, building teams and working collaboratively with community groups and organizations to develop projects that revitalize and invigorate the neighborhoods and cities that they serve. Prior to starting her firm, Monica served as the founding director of Impact Detroit and led project teams at both Studio, Studio Gang and Ross Barney Architects. During that time, Monica was in the design of award one civic scale buildings, such as the Champagne Public Library and the Duluth Civil Engineering Building. Outside of civic projects, Monica serves as co-chair of the Sensible Growth Committee of the Metropolitan Planning Council, the strategic consultant for ARCA Works, and is on the board of the Delta Institute. She has been an adjunct professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology since 2007, engaging students in social impact design practices. Chada has been recognized as an emerging leader by the Design Futures Council, and in 2013, she was featured in the inaugural Public Interest Design 100 list of leaders. She holds a Master's of Architecture from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a Bachelor's of Environmental Studies in Architecture from the University of Waterloo in Canada. Please welcome Monica Chada. Monica, you're muted.
All right, is that better, everybody? That's it. All right, sorry about that. Uh, if we didn't have some technology issues, it wouldn't be a Zoom lecture. Um, I'd really like to thank AIA Ohio um, for the invitation. This is really exciting. And it's an opportunity for us to sort of um, share work that we're doing, but also hopefully engage in a dialogue. So I'm really excited about the fact that we'll have a chance to have some questions uh, towards the end of the discussion. And one of the things I'm hoping to be able to do uh, in this conversation is talk a little bit about um, the impacts of equity and development on economic development and the work that we do. So hopefully as we frame this conversation moving forward, you'll sort of see, um, I was joking just before the conversation, but sort of looking to see if the dots get connected and, and if, uh, if kind of some of what we're supposing or proposing or talking about kind of links into the work that we do in a comprehensive and understandable way. Um, I'm going to pull over to the screen. So I thought it might make sense um, to talk a little bit about who we are. And when we talk about who we are, we're really talking about the communities in which we work, the clients that we work with, and our team. And our team, as you'll see when I go through the lecture, is uh, tends to be a very um, a very mixed group. It's a very uh, inclusive group of a number of whether it's uh, designers, um, construction professionals, fabricators, artists, it depends on the project, but we work, our, our team is a very loose definition. It's not limited to just uh, those who are physically in our office. And then um, when, when I talk about sort of clients and communities, I often use images from the charrettes and the workshops that we do to really sort of show that um, it's a process. All of our work is a process. It's not singular. We don't we don't sit in front of our computers and try to solve um, for problems. We actually try to start by listening and um, engaging with stakeholders to understand maybe what issues are or what challenges are. And then we go from there into actually using design as a way to um, get to solutions or get to proposals and ideas. Um, this is a few, uh, I, th I thought I'd introduce our team. Uh, we're, we're a small office, um, so, um, what you, who you're seeing on the screen is we've got myself, Maria, Joanne, and Jess, who are all architects in the office, and then uh, Zabib, Dhruv, and Charlotte, who have actually helped with a lot of the research and content that's come into this lecture. So um, they are University of Chicago interns working with us on research around equitable development. And then why, right? Why civic projects? I've been asked, I mean, I, you know, having worked at some really phenomenal firms, having worked with Jeannie Gang at Studio Gang, having worked with Carol at Ross Barney Architects, you know, it, it may or may not be um, anticipated that, that I would choose to sort of leave what I call traditional practice and start a firm. And one of the reasons we did this is that um, for me, a lot of architectural work is sort of in a little bit of a traditional uh, boundaries, right? Like often the client has already defined the problem, has defined maybe a site or a building and is looking for the architect to help sort of program and build and design for the project. And what we did is we established a practice, a hybrid practice that really wants to get um, involved in projects before there are, uh, literally before there are projects, which might sound a little strange, but the idea of us starting at pre-design and starting maybe at the missioning, mission building and visioning that might happen with an organization. So a few of the organizations that you'll hear me talk about, we have been privileged to get to work from, from the beginning. So often we ha help develop um, the vision of what might become space in the future, but we actually go through all of the engagement with stakeholders and community to understand maybe what the problems are that need to be solved and then build off these solutions to sort of look at how design can be, a, a, how design techniques and design methodology can be used um, at, as means to arrive at a solution. So you can sort of see on this graph, we really start kind of before there's a project and work all the way through uh, once a building might be inhabited um, and, and kind of look at even post-occupancy, but sort of like, what is the impact of the building and the built environment that we've created? Um, so much of our work is about talking and working collectively and sharing. So you'll, you'll um, continually see um, 
uh, different stakeholders, different groups that we're working with sort of highlighted throughout the entire uh, presentation. And where we, we put this together kind of for a little bit of fun, but I'm so I'm Canadian, born and uh, born and bred Canadian, but grew up in Ottawa and went to school near Toronto in Waterloo. Uh, and then a lot of my work has been between Chicago and Detroit, primarily in Chicago. Um, I have to do a little plug. My daughter is at Kenyon in Gambier, Ohio. So um, I was especially excited to be invited uh, for this lecture. But as you can see, so much of the work is sort of concentrating around the Great Lakes, what is considered the third coast and kind of, it's a very kind of regional and neighborhood and localized approach to the work that we do. When we start looking at Chicago, um, you'll see sort of what I've, I've shown in kind of center, center of downtown Chicago, but sort of north side and south side. And the south and west sides where the majority of our work is, are uh, neighborhoods that have been primarily disenfranchised. And I, I don't always like using that terminology, but but a lot of the neighborhoods in which we work are under are neighborhoods that have historically been underinvested in. With the current initiatives with Invest Southwest, with uh, Maurice Cox as commissioner, with Mayor Lightfoot, there's been a, a strong push um, to um, build on design excellence and build on design to allow for development in greater percentages, in, in greater proportions in the south and west side neighborhoods of Chicago. So I, for those of you who sort of saw the description or sort of saw the invitation, you know, I, I want this to focus around equity and design. And, and for us, equity uh, can mean a lot about a lot of things, but equity sort of focused around economic development um, and equity kind of focused around um, working with entrepreneurs and, and building um, building uh, businesses, working and collaborating with other designers and other team members, and then working and collaborating in a way to sort of build um, housing, uh, affordable housing solutions and other reuses of buildings throughout um, Chicago's South Side. So one of the projects when I was working with the University of Detroit Mercy at the Detroit uh, Collaborative Design Center was focused um, around the Avenue of Fashion, the Livernois Corridor. And what we did in that project is we were really looking at what had been a historic avenue of fashion, right? A, a really um, significant space and place in Detroit that was had become underutilized. Um, this picture is a little further down uh, the Livernois Corridor, but as, as all of you know, right, sort of uh, underutilized retail commercial space and how do we kind of continue to make that vibrant and hold again. So um, in 2013, 2014, we were st starting to work with uh, originally the Urban Land Institute with the University of Detroit Mercy and eventually with the Detroit Economic um, Group um, Corp, uh, corporation on what would be temporary activation to become more permanent activation. I imagine most people are familiar with the terminology of pop-up, but the idea of um, taking underutilized spaces and coming to productive uses for a short amount of time. So this first project, what, what happened is around along the Avenue of Fashion, there were several successful businesses, but a lot of vacant uh, commercial business, a lot of the vacant real estate. And we were able to work with um, um, work with one of the retail owners on their adjacent um, store, which had been empty. So you can sort of see in here the moving day was a you know emptying and and kind of finding a way to um, clear the space to then use the space, and then um, with many 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 partners, uh, there was an event scheduled. Um, called, um, um, there was an event scheduled for the pop-up for the Avenue of Fashion in June. So over the course of a weekend, we had probably over 200, 225 people come through both the store and the corridor. So one of the things that was part of the proposal and the project was that you got, um, little um, cards and the card, you know, you'd get a stamp every time you visited a different retailer or a different location and then we'd enter that for a raffle and there were prizes. Um, the other thing that was going on is that um, because this was historically the Avenue of Fashion, 
young designers were invited and there was this amazing fashion show. The, the runway was supposed to be uh, down the midway. Unfortunately, um, it was raining that day, so we had to move it inside. But you, there, there was all of this energy that had come out of what was sort of started as an urban corridor study, was worked on by students and community members a local organization was formed and then a number of stakeholders came together to sort of get to this pop-up. And the big thing that I think, the reason I'm highlighting this pop, highlighting this pop-up is because from that, the Detroit Economic Growth Council did a call for enter, entries to animate 12 to 14 of the spaces. So the idea was to pair entrepreneurs and designers to animate spaces. So you can see in here, there was a series of events. Uh, this is one of the stores that was animated and there were several um, retailers and businesses, including uh, this uh, fiber store and uh, a cupcake and coffee shop that opened. The, the retailers were provided with um, rent-free space for three months and were invited to stay uh, through the holidays and then continue their businesses into January. Out of the 12 to 14 activated spaces, there were probably about seven that were active businesses, and three of those businesses were able to stay past the, past the pop-up stage or past the free rent stage. The other thing that's really amazing about this is that over the next five years, I, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but there were about 12 other new businesses, including restaurants that have come to the same corridor. So the thing is like, Design was kind of an impetus. It was a little tool in a much bigger puzzle, but the, the opportunity to use design as a way to sort of start activating and animating the space became a way that uh, a number of businesses could thrive. And I think the pairing of the design community with entrepreneurs, again, became a way to sort of move, move, move the concept forward and kind of allow for success. Um, when we were talking and pulling together this lecture, we sort of talked about, you know, how do we tell the story, right? How do we tell the story of our work, but tell it in the context of who we work with? And Rachel, Rachel Bernier Green of Lori Lane's Bake Shop is one of um, the amazing entrepreneurs and clients we've been working with for several years. So um, Rachel um, started an online bake shop, an online bakery, and in, uh, in, in through the course of um, our work with her, we sort of saw her go from pop-up to, to uh, permanent retail. And the way this started was um, in Bronzeville, the, um, what had happened is we had had the opportunity to work on uh, the pop-up and the work in Detroit. And at the scale of Detroit, the way uh, we were looking at vacancy and issues and um, opportunities, I want us to do that at the scale, at, at, a, at a smaller scale in the neighborhoods in Chicago. So Civic Projects was kind of born between this Detroit to Chicago transition. And one of the early projects was doing pop up, uh, a pop-up retail location in Bronzeville um, on Chicago's South Side. So Rachel, who's kind of in the bottom corner, Lane's Bake Shop was one of five businesses. Um, so one of the things we did is we had multiple businesses, multiple programming, animated through the course of the weekend. And Rachel, one of the things that happened with is that uh, we were able to introduce her to the Small Business Administration uh, consumer group out of uh, downtown Chicago, out of the city. And she then became partnered with the Greater Englewood Community Development Corporation. And the reason I'm, I'm tying these things together is that, that we touched on projects in each of these sort of steps. So Rachel went from a weekend pop-up to working in um, in what became one of our spaces, a, build a business incubator accelerator in uh, Englewood. And she worked with the Greater Englewood Community Development Corporation on a series of workshops um, that allowed businesses to pitch to Whole Foods. So Whole Foods was coming to Englewood um, and, and this was in advance of, of Whole Foods opening in Englewood. So from the development corporation, um, from the business accelerator and working with the community, um, Rachel was um, selected as one of the vendors for Whole Foods. So we had a situation here where Whole Foods um, worked with 27 uh, different local businesses to supply and source that in a neighborhood Whole Foods location. 
from that, she was at both Whole Foods and Starbucks. Um, Rachel started looking at a bricks and mortar location. So she was able to lease the space on Cottage Grove and look at doing a, a long-term both bakery and cafe location. And we continue to work with her and, and, and here are sort of renderings and images of what that um, could become or was gonna become. Um, someone said, don't focus on the pandemic, but um, we did stop construction uh, or stop the opportunity for construction right around the pandemic. So this, this is an unbuilt project um, thus far. And then uh, one of the partners that we have or one of the organizations that we um, are constantly working with is Experimental Station, which is where, where we're physically housed. Uh, Experimental Station is a nonprofit uh, organization that hosts uh, a number of uh, businesses of themselves um, and, and other nonprofits and opportunities, which I'll get to in a second. But the physical location is what is a former parking garage in Woodlawn, just south of the University of Chicago. And there was a fire in 2001 that gutted everything except the four walls. This is not a project that we designed. This predates um, us as a firm, but we're housed within this building. So Experimental Station, um, you can see from this diagram, is, is it has the 61st Street Farmer's Market uh, every Saturday outside. Uh, Blackstone Bicycles, a uh, bike repair and um, business is on site that also uh, works with youth on, on training. Uh, Build Coffee, a small coffee shop is there. Invisible Institute, Southside Weekly, um, arts and cultural programming, all sorts of community partners and organizations and nonprofits either use the space or housed in the space. So uh, this is a quick glimpse of outside. So after the fire, there was an opportunity to actually build a mezzanine and move up. And um, one of the businesses that's incubated is, is the corner business, which used to be a sole vegan food that's now uh, in another location, in a bigger location, and currently uh, houses Build Coffee uh, with two co-owners. And they are growing their business um, through, the, through the retail site that's, that's on site at Experimental Station. And then this is another area upstairs that was used during the Chicago Biennial to talk about um, by Invisible Institute and Forensic Architecture to talk about the shooting of Harith Augustus that occurred in South Shore. Um, and then we got really lucky. So we were already co-sharing about 2016, 2017, we started co-sharing in the building. And I had a conversation with Connie and was like, okay, we're growing. What a great moment. We're growing, we need more space, where do we go? And she introduced me to what you see on the left, which was a completely unfinished corner of the building. So that parking garage that you just saw grown up to the mezzanine, but wasn't fully built out uh, as late as 2017. And to the right, you're seeing the, the space that we were able to create. So Civic Project Shared Office was a Civic Projects project, which sounds a little weird, but basically we got to design and build out our own office space, which was pretty amazing. And then continuing to work with Experimental Station, there's an abandoned fire station uh, station down the that down the street that they are looking to potentially um, acquire and then build upon. So we worked with Experimental Station to look at could the bike program expand? Could a commercial kitchen and more uh, community retail come to the area? So um, to the left of this is the Metro tracks. And then beyond this, uh, beyond the Metro tracks is actually where the Obama Presidential Center Museum, uh, Obama Presidential Center will be constructed. So the idea uh, with several of these projects is to become hubs within neighborhoods that then have kind of a ripple effect or extend beyond their own, their building footprint. Um, so both of those projects are really about economic development and economic growth. And I think you can't really have economic development and economic growth without considering equitable housing. And equitable housing really does center around affordable housing, but that really centers around kind of all aspects. So how do you in a neighborhood develop housing, design housing, build housing, manage housing in a way that provides affordable solutions, considered solutions, quality spaces to live, and really opportunities to thrive. Um, so one of the things we're doing 
now is we actually have vertical integration. So Civic Projects Architecture is an entity unto itself, minority owned, female owned. But our team, our projects actually extend to ballast construction, general construction, um, development prop and property management. So we actually go from um, buying property uh, all the way through developing and I'll use one project to kind of showcase that. So the, the project we call Cheerful Credit. Um, Cheerful Credit is its name because it's 4238 South Cottage Grove and the, as the sign says, it's the Cheerful Credit furniture. The, it's a Chicago furniture store that offers Cheerful Credit. Um, so we're very enamored with the sign um, and the passion that kind of went into sort of this building being created. Um, but when we bought the building, the uh, 10 residential units um, on the second and third floor were, com were, were not vacant, but were uh, completely unkept and uncared for. So I, um, I at one point was trying to describe the project to someone and I talked about how it was sort of the, the commercial history of Bronzeville on the ground floor and a much more uh, rural location, unkempt, unconsidered location on the upper floors. Um, the, the building owner, I don't think went up the stairs anymore, like literally didn't go up and, and work with or work with the tenants. And there were probably four or five of the units still occupied with very minimal services and very minimal consideration about the living conditions. So we're in the process of uh, gutting and rehabbing. We worked, uh, we worked with those who were living in the, um, in the building uh, to, to find appropriate other locations to live. Uh, the conditions did not allow us to, to, to stay in place as we did the renovations. And a lot of things, um, a lot of design opportunities and spatial opportunities and quality opportunities sort of came up as we went through the design. Because one of the great things about owning the building you're designing and doing the construction of the building you're designing is that you can actually make decisions and improve on the project as you go through the process. So this is the, the slightly convoluted layout of the um, building. So there's, there's five units per floor and there's this amazing rear space that I think we're gonna start calling the backyard. And to the right um, is east, which is the north facade that you've been seeing images of. And then one of the many things that that happened as we sort of started doing the demo work and clearing the space out is we is kind of the uncovering, right? What's what's the process of discovering when you're designing? And there were some amazing artifacts and pieces of, of furniture that were like, how do we how do we celebrate these? How do we keep these yet integrate them into a new space? Uh, so so what we're doing is we're actually sort of preserving um, these artifacts and incorporating them into the bedrooms. And you can sort of see here a little bit of what that's going to look like. And then similarly, when we started removing the plaster, we, we kind of knew this, but then realized it once the plaster came down is both of the sidewalls, the north and south walls of the project are at, were formerly exterior walls. So there's something that's called ghost signs that we uncovered. So the old hand painted signs on the sign side of buildings uh, that you, you often see when you're driving around had actually been covered up and those became interior spaces. So we've opened those up and we're actually um, revealing those, we're cleaning them up and we're gonna keep that as part of the, the, the space, right? So these bedrooms are gonna have these amazing 14, 15 foot ceiling heights with these painted walls as, as kind of where you live and where you sleep. Um, and then this, this, is, um, this isn't a high budget project uh, in terms of you know, cost of construction, but we're really trying to be considerate about how we detail and how we consider it and how we take care of it. And so this is just an example of a small detail where we're wrapping our, our windows with, with birch, uh, Baltic birch to create a little window ledge. And this becomes, you know, the place you put plants, the place you sit, the place you hang out, whatever it sort of becomes. But it's it's kind of just a reveal detail that's kind of changing it from sort of the, the potential plainness or potential uniform uniformity from unit to unit that you might see throughout, throughout Bronzeville. 
And then part of our long-term goal or vision is there's an adjacent vacant lot. And um, we've started conversations with the city and with the aldermen about how do, how do we also return that to productive use? So not only are we talking about returning 10 units to productive use on this commercial corridor, we're talking about building more units for more, more productive use. And uh, this is sort of gives you an idea of sort of the floor plan. Um, most of the units I've been showing you are three bedroom units, so they're very family friendly. And then another way that the, the city is looking at um, affordable housing and opportunities for affordable housing in the city is by the addition of accessory dwelling units. So the city of Chicago has recently um, developed an ordinance that allows for accessory dwelling units to be built in several neighborhoods. It's a pilot project right now. And for those who may be familiar, sort of an accessory dwelling unit can be construction above a garage, like what at one point was called a granny flat or an in-law unit. Um, or it could be the expansion of, um, of uh, garden units. So in our case, uh, we've been approached to do several accessory dwelling units that we haven't started at this point, but we have um, with, with, again, a six foot that we own and, and are, have renovated, have been able to add two garden units to the basement of that to, uh, as part of this accessory dwelling unit addition, but also rendering a six flat, uh, taking a six flat and rendering it uh, to be a productive eight flat unit. The garden units, because they are a little bit smaller in their garden units, also allow us to, to rent um, at a more affordable cost. So we do a combination of um, Section 8, which is voucher holders, uh, affordable rental, and then market rate rental. We, we, uh, and the reason I'm saying that is that it's, it's allowing for kind of a mixed, um, a mixed group to be within one house. And, or one building and all of these all of these buildings that we're developing are in the same neighborhoods where we're working so our clients our community and our residents are all kind of of the same neighborhood another way to look at it is sort of vacant lot activation and this was a project with carlo parenti and what we were looking at is what are ways to animate vacant lots over time right what's temporary activation what's permanent activation and we looked at a series of modules which you can see here in interior and exterior configurations and then the first step of it was a really tiny project but we started with what we called an internet table so the the idea was that you could start with a four by eight module and kind of keep growing and this first element that you see here is used in a in a city of Chicago plaza where it's providing power and internet access when there's markets or other events in the space. So the the pieces are literally rolled out and then rolled back at the end of an event. Um, who do we work with? How do we work? Uh, really, when I started talking at the beginning, it's really about sort of community clients and team and a lot of uh, different combinations of of groups. So I thought it might be an interesting um, point to talk a little bit about collaboration as a catalyst for design. We don't work in a silo. Uh, we are always building relationships and building teams for each project individually. So one of, one of our partners is We Build Agency. And We Build Agency in, uh, and Civic Projects is working together on several projects right now. And, the, and Star Farm, which is shown here, is um, a case where we're doing a design firm partnership with Architect of Record. So we're the Architect of Record in this particular project. And what this is, is it's a small two-story building that's going to become both office and a healthy grocery on the ground floor. So Star Farm is in back of the yards. And you can see here sort of a vision of what the interior space will become. Uh, similarly, another collaboration that we're doing is focusing around, it's, it's about co-design, but it's focusing about, uh, it's focusing around residential again. So in addition to rendering um, vacant buildings productive, we're also starting to look at rendering vacant lots productive. And this project, as we're going through the process is with Mere Collective, and you can see Kara in these pictures uh, where we're starting to do studies and look at, you know, how can we build new construction three unit uh, buildings in a considered way and an affordable way and with uh, some level of innovation. 
So we're doing the studies. Um, in this case, you're seeing the paper models, you're seeing the sketches. And then we're also looking obviously at process. So we really wanna look at how do we take the, the masonry and the brick and the, the sort of what I would call the patina of Chicago, right? A material that you're used to seeing over and over through history. And then how do you pair that with something maybe uh, a little more resilient, a little more contemporary. So we're looking really at sort of both metal facades and masonry facades and trying to figure out a way to bring those together. So this is just a precedent study that we were looking at. And again, we're looking at uh, three unit apartments. It's starting to feel like a theme, but it allows for a couple of different configurations, right? You can have larger families or you can have shared living situations. And things that we're starting to do is we're really looking at like cross ventilation with nooks, right? How do you borrow light from a long corridor? How do you take maybe what is a rear co corner and, and render light, maybe, you know, open up the bedroom to the back area so that you can get uh, kind of almost like a separate living space that opens up onto the, onto the deck or onto the back porch. So we're just like noodling with the Chicago housing prototype and trying to look at just ways to kind of delicately touch on it and delicately uh, make it a little more considered and then getting into sort of just all the way down to wall construction and kind of what is that dimension and, and what is the rating and how do we how do we do this in an affordable way and then the co-creation extends obviously to both clients and stakeholders and I think this is really important as well because um, we, we, our team is not just us, right? If we want to talk about um, building equity in any way, shape, form, and talk about economic development, you have to be working collectively to empower everyone in, in the conversation, right? So this, it isn't, um, I'm a designer, I'm going to come do this for you, right? It's very much of how do we work together to build a better um just build a better place, uh, even though that maybe sounds a little bit simple. Uh, one of our partners, someone we've been working with, an organization we've been working with for about four years now is the Chicago Torture Justice Center. And um, without getting too, too deep into their history, because um, it, it's meaningful and I can't, I can't give it enough space in, in a short lecture, but the Chicago Torture Justice Center was founded out of um, both activism and legal action against uh, the Chicago Police Department, specifically Commander Burge. Uh, Commander Burge was accused of uh, torturing a number of people into false confessions. Um, so the the what you're seeing is is one of the activist moments before uh, um, some of the survivors began to get re released from prison. So so it went from a denied action by the city to acknowledgement and in that acknowledgement, the Chicago Torture Justice Center, Chicago Torture Justice Memorial, um, and a series of educational components and reparations were all kind of part of the act that the city um, put together. And we were really um, privileged to be introduced to, um, to the organization uh, about a year after uh, the ordinance passed. And we, um, we did a series of workshops. And what we did is we, we kind of did, I would call it strategic planning, but really it was a series of listening sessions. We're kind of like, what, what's needed here, right? Like we're, we're, we were listening to, to a community where um, survivors had been imprisoned for dozens of years, uh, partners and family members hadn't seen um, either parents, spouses, children, depending. Uh, and the community just didn't, didn't really know enough about what had happened and what was going on. So we did these listening sessions and really tried to understand if there was to be a space, what would that space be like and be for and who would it be for? Um, and um, I often talk about um, one of the partners that uh, we worked with um, uh, one of the partners of the survivors, when we when we when we had one of our listening sessions, was kind of like, "This is the first time somebody's asked us what we want, right?" And and because this, this this was 
after all of the work of activism, all of the work of social justice, all of the work by pro bono lawyers, researchers, reporters, all of this work had been happening. It was incredibly, incredibly important that then we became to a moment where we could begin to talk about space. It's like, you are no longer um, bound by what has happened. We want to create a space for you and an opportunity for you and a place to be. And the vision that started getting outlined was this idea of a place that would primarily be for survivors. And this is what came out of the workshop. We, we didn't predetermine this, but a place that would be supportive of the family, right? Family, partner, spouses, whoever family might be, but then also have a community component, be sort of a, have a, a component of education and teaching and outreach. And it was very clear that, that when the space got created, it really, really, really had to support the survivors, but also had to bring in both family and community. And this project has taken a long time to come together. And we've done a series of workshops uh, in, in that time. And the workshops have been focused around how someone is seen, how someone is visioned, how someone feels resilient. So there, there's been a series of work. And then we also were invited to work on the memorial, uh, Chicago Torture Justice Memorial. So this was a competition. There were five invited artists. Um, our project did not win, uh, so it will not be constructed, but the, the design I'm showing here, what when we held the workshops, one of the things that Mark Clement said was the integrity of justice looks like us. We give it identity and without us, there is no picture. And I think the thing that resonated was this idea, right? Without us, there is no picture. We're talking about over 120 identified survivors. And what we chose to do was try to represent each survivor individually. And what you're seeing is um, a, a component of the memorial where every single bench, every single element is unique to the person that it is rec that the bench is recognizing. And you can see um, sort of in this image, what, what we did is we, we, we established a couple of markers. So the, the, the grade plane, is the the age that the person was when they were um, when the police apprehended them and 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 the torture occurred, and that is sort of the the vertical line, and then the horizontal plane becomes the the what we call stolen time, right? What happened during the time I was in prison? So as an example, maybe someone's child is born, maybe a nephew graduated from college, maybe a parent passed away. So we, we designed it so that every tab would recognize a particular moment in time. And then the, 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 the continuation of the bench or the element either becomes um, a, a release, um, sometimes a death, um, sometimes it, it just sort of continues um, because the person is still currently in prison. So I'm, this project is really meaningful for a lot of ways, but, but part of what I think is really important about it is its specificity and its individuality, right? Like how, how do you design for someone and not just in generalities? And I think that's something that, that this can begin to show. Uh, and then here, we're just sort of, I'm also just uh, highlighting some of the, the, the partners who've been part of the, this process. Um, a current project in Woodlawn um, that we're starting to work on at 63rd and King is um, with Sunshine Enterprises and Sunshine Gospel Ministries. And we're looking to develop um, a community center hub, uh, community building that, that would, would be uh, in the neighborhood. This, um, I, I love this photo and I love to showcase it is, it just shows you sort of the relationship to downtown, right? Like. Uh, people are very familiar with Chicago's North Side or maybe know certain neighborhoods. And we don't always realize that you can be equidistant south of the city and completely accessible by train, completely accessible by public transportation and be like 15 minutes away from downtown. So the neighborhoods we work in are, are kind of all loosely visible in this image. Um, and then specifically the, the where I was just mentioning is, is sort of at this corner and you can start to see the connectivity of, of the site we're looking at. This blue dot here is actually where we are geographically. The Obama Presidential Center lies in Jackson Park and the University of Chicago lies along the midway. And what we did, what we've done so far is a series of studies. So I don't, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the individual of these images, but we're doing a series of studies to really just start looking at 
what kinds of community uses and productive uses can come. And the, the way we're doing this is through a series of that pre-designed community workshops, engagement and stakeholder outreach that, that I've talked a little bit about before. Um, a very explicit example of, of this work is our work with Global Citizenship Experience Lab School. So in this case, uh, we're working with students to identify the program and identify the elements of the project. So if you were to be a high school downtown, what kinds of things would you want to have and what kinds of uh, opportunities you, would you want that to encompass? And things like democratic and free spaces and outreach is something that the students had really looked at. So all of a sudden we weren't designing a school where it was just about education in and onto itself. The big, um, what we heard most resonant in the workshops was this idea of community impact and outreach. So how do I take what I learn here and bring it back to where I'm from? So all of a sudden we weren't designing, you know, a series of classrooms, we were designing spaces in which students could invite community in and design spaces in which we could share out. So, um, and the process was the, the sort of integrated process that we've talked about. We would come with plans and drawings and work with, you know, post-it notes. And, and you can sort of see from some of these rule, words, right? We're talking about privacy or open gallery, or we're, we, we don't program with like, here's a, 10 by 10 office here, and here's a 20 by 30 classroom there. We actually talk about qualities of spaces and kinds of spaces and use that as a way to have a conversation. So it's also about making the language of design accessible and making the opportunities behind design accessible. And these are sort of the, some of the corridors, the idea of these corridors becoming learning spaces uh, for the students. And then um, I would be a little remiss if I didn't touch on uh, our biggest project in the office. Um, we are uh, part of the museum design team for the Obama Presidential Center. Um, and it's incredibly exciting and a really phenomenal opportunity. And one of the, the nascent steps, right, right at the beginning, sort of predating the design we're doing now, was holding a series of workshops and really focusing around the idea of story. So if we're talking about uh, telling stories as a woven narrative and Obama's presidency being a narrative and a story. We, we've been talking about um, in the design process about like, what is my story in relationship to the president's story? Or what, what is my story in the way that I might um, go to a museum and, and understand a tale about a famous person? Um, so, so we're trying to weave two narratives, right? We're trying to make it personal and impactful all within the same narrative. And one of the first ways we did it was through a series of workshops talking about, you know, what does active citizenship mean? What does it mean to be a citizen? How do we share and tell these stories? And what what these workshops came back with were story. We we started with the stories, but then asked people to visualize. Right? What what's that narrative? What does it look like? If it if it's about exchange, what does exchange look like? So. What you're seeing on the screen is, is work with about 17 high schools or about 40 kids in a workshop and, um, and, and nobody with an architectural background starting to visualize what their personal stories would be like and how they would exchange it. So when we talked about shared stories and what does that look like, um, they were able, uh, the students were able to, to tell their story and, and be um, clear. Um, and, and then the, the means of conveying and the ideas behind the storytelling is what we've sort of used in, as one of the steps to the design process. And then I show this really quickly as just, here are some of the tools, right? We, we use Mad Libs, we use Post-it notes, we use cards, we use drawing, we use writing, but like all of these communication tools. And um, these are a number of the team members. Uh, it's, it's a very large team that we're working with. And then I think I want to sort of end with a few minutes about making the language of equitable development accessible. Um, we've talked loosely about the equity in, in terms of physical design and projects, but now uh, what, what we're, we're working on in the office through our research and this particular project focuses on was um, how do you make that language accessible, right? How do you communicate it? Like we can talk about 
um, doing housing development in neighborhoods and then fostering develop young developers and uh, local developers, teaching the tools to then go do more development. And we can do that, but, but those kinds of things can't happen if we don't make the language accessible. Um, so in terms of our research, we're looking at things like performas and um, uh, spreadsheets and all of these different tools. We're trying to, we're developing a website to sort of make these tools and make this accessible. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I had the privilege of working with um, Balkrishna Doshi, uh, Pritzker Prize winner in, uh, when, in India uh, when I was in college. And Doshi's entire work in architecture is focused on social engagement, is focused on equity, and is focused on sort of what I'll call community wealth building in, 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 in the project. So he's developing housing that is social housing, that is intergenerational, that um, you can have a, a, a space that could be a store, could be a rental unit, um, could be for your in-laws. And all of that is embedded in the kinds of development that he did. And so much of his work is relevant and important and impactful to work in the States. But frankly, very few people um, are familiar with his work. And Wrightwood um, Gallery had a retrospective of his work that was um, curated by his granddaughter and originally at the Vitro Design Museum. And I was invited um, to, to develop program uh, and the program we decided would focus around making his work accessible and ideas behind his engagement and equity work uh, accessible. And um, I, the, I define the problem as how do you how do you make this work in India accessible and um, understandable by a, a an, an intergenerational audience in Chicago, right? How do, how do you connect the dots there? This was all during the pandemic in two very different geographies. So we worked with Aisha Butler, who's an activist, Natalie Moore, who's an author and a uh, journalist, reporter, and with Edra Soto, who's an artist. And what we did is we invited each, uh, e each uh, Aisha, Edra, and Natalie to walk the exhibit um, in dialogue and then walk a neighborhood or a space of their choice. So you're seeing Aisha in, in this particular photo where there's this moment where Aisha's like seeing all that, like, like in India, a lot of the housing in alleys and porches all spill into and onto each other. And, and in, this, in, in a moment when we were walking through Englewood, Aisha talked about uh, from India to Englewood. And she sort of had this moment of sort of saying, maybe we could invert the block and think differently about housing is gridded and, and in Chicago, just by virtue of the fact that um, I've seen something that's a precedent somewhere else. And then with um, Edra Soto, we had conversations focused more around materiality and texture and, and opportunity. So it's sort of like, how do you use uh, simple materials in innovative ways became part of it. And all of these were a series of uh, 10 minute videos um, that are on site, uh, on the website um, with Wrightwood and filmed by Spirit of Space. And then the last um, video we did was with Natalie Moore uh, and she, um, she, she's written about the South Side. She's a reporter with WBEZ. And she took us um, from the exhibit to Bronzeville and we had um, a really fantastic discussion about public and private space and sort of um, how, the, how the neighborhood um, is, is seen by different people over time. So she was sort of talking about some of the social nature of what she was seeing in the exhibit and Doshi's work and then the social nature of, of walking through the, the community in Bronzeville. Um, so I, I tried to put a couple of next steps in here. I have, I have a few um, definitions about some of the equitable development and other work, but I think, I think this might really be a spot to pause and, um, and, and kind of hopefully open this up for more of a conversation. Um, next steps for us looks like uh, continuing to develop the work and projects that we're working with but even more so sort of um, fostering and um, 
fostering and growing, I guess, maybe is the way to say it. Um, how do we how, how do we continue to make design accessible and how do we continue to work in partnership maybe is the best way to say that. Um, so those are some of our next steps. And I think I'm gonna um, probably um, use this as a moment to pause and kind of open it up to some questions and then maybe fill in a few um, blanks after that. Um, so I'll end with, um, a quick shout out to our website and kind of how to get a hold of us or active, uh, um, access us. Um, we are um, really thrilled to kind of have a chance to sort of speak outside of our neighborhoods, but we're also really excited to enter into dialogue about design and have design conversations. So I absolutely invite any of you who are interested in talking to us more or are in Chicago or passing through, let's grab a cup of coffee um, or shoot me an email or send me a text and just let, let's keep this conversation going. Let's kind of grow the conversation and, and sort of find ways to share. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it back. I think you should all be on screen now, right? Thank you, Monica. Um... I, I really enjoyed um, how your scale of projects are really ingrained in the community that you serve. And um, I've, I've always had a hand in, in working in the uh, inner core city that I live in. And um, so it's very invigorating to see others work the same way. Um, we, we have a, a lively question in the chat. So I will try to get folks through as so we can get through all of these. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, uh, architect Stephen Kordowski in Cleveland. He has a question for you. Hi, Steve, did you wanna ask your question? Yes, yeah, Steve, please ask your question. Need to unmute. Can you unmute him, Kate? I cannot. I. He has to. Maybe we'll come back to him. Can you let Haley in? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, hey, Haley. Hi, Monica. Um, my question for you is that your work feels deeply inspired by the history of the place, um, like the Tearful Credit Project that you showed us. Can you elaborate on the importance of amplifying, preserving, exposing a place's history? Um, how does that show up through design choices? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think it shows up in a lot of ways. And I think that recognizing what's there and listening and looking and researching what's there is definitely a place to start. Um, we're trying more and more to understand the history of place, sort of the, not just the physical history or design history, but also sort of the, the community history and the storytelling and the narrative that comes behind it. So if we understand sense of place, I think we can better design um, new, uh, design new. Uh, but then to your point about sort of history and recognizing buildings, Chicago has so much amazing building stock. We're working really hard. The majority of our projects right now are in existing buildings as opposed to new construction because we're really trying to return spaces to productive use. It's something sort of fundamental. Um, if we talk about sustainability, I think if you can return an existing space to productive use, that's, that's much more significant uh, than it, it's it the the impact of that is is really significant before you even get into other sustainability um, energy methodologies and other things. So protect what's there, celebrate what's there, and then from there kind of um, uncover what the new uses might be. 
Great, Th thank you. Um, Steve's having uh, mic issues, so I'll, I'll convey his question. He says he really enjoys your talk. He's glad to see a firm producing quality and important work that exceeds project expectations based on project types and not high-end costs. And his question is, does your firm receive grants, et cetera, in order to sustain financial solvency? <laughs> I, I wish we received more grants. Um, it's a good question. Uh, so we, we are a, an LLC. We are uh, not a nonprofit. Uh, we do fee-for-service work, but to help us, there's a couple things we do. One thing is the fact that we do um, development and management of, of, of real estate does help support the practice. They, they're, I, sometimes I say that and sometimes I sort of hesitate to say that, but I think it's actually important. It's like we, we've built our own little circular economy. Um, we work with the, our nonprofit clients to help write grants that may then fund us for technical services. So we definitely are involved in that process. We're, you know, better at grant writing and description and image creation than I think we ever thought we would be. Um, but it's critical. There's things like neighborhood opportunity funds in Chicago that the city offers funding. There's technical assistance grants through Chicago Community Trust and others. So, so we definitely help our clients um, uh, apply for those. Um, uh, and then, you know, we, we do a little, a uh, friend of mine's firm does a lot of uh, what they call the Robin Hood model. But like, you know, when we're working with clients where maybe we're garnering a more typical fee or more regular fee, we'll kind of apply that back to another project where we can do that for a much more reduced rate. Um, we work a lot harder than the number of hours we bill for, but we do try to, we, we are a, a fee for service model. I, I won't pretend the numbers work, but, but I do try to, we, we try to do reduced fee or more hours, but we're trying not to be a pro bono architecture firm. I, I, I don't think that's a sustainable model. Great. Thank you. Um, Kate, can you let Mike mock in? He has a question. And while we're waiting on Mike, I just want to remind everybody that our next lecture is Thursday, June 24th with Gerard Damiani of Studio D Arc out of Pittsburgh. And also in the chat box, Kate has put the link in for you to get your HSW credits. Mike? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, hi, Monica. Uh, my question is, uh, like the chicken or the egg, uh, which came first? Uh, you seeking out nonprofit community projects as a target for your design work or the nonprofit community projects seeking you out for your particular design process? It's probably both, which isn't a complete answer, but um, one of the reasons I started Civic Projects and, and we've kind of developed the way we are is that I believe designers and architects actually need to be not just problem solving, but help identify the problems from the beginning. So if you're working, um, it, it's, this, it's this idea that you have to create the work, right? You can't wait for work to come from, for, to you. So in that aspect, not waiting for work to come to you, we are often working in communities or working with areas so that there may be something that needs to be solved and we're able to be part of that process and, and work towards a solution because we've been doing this for a while now, we have gotten to the point and it's, it's, it's always exciting to me and, and sometimes confusing to me in a, in a good way of like some, uh, we, will, we will now have much more outreach, right? So we may work with nonprofit A and over time we've worked with nonprofit A for a couple of years, then nonprofit B will give us a call and be like, hey, I love what you're doing with so-and-so, you know, can we work with you now? So it's, it's a bit of both, right? But, but I think you have to be, problem seeking and not just problem solving to sort of survive in architecture right now. All right, thank you. And I, I like your piece of jewelry, thanks, thanks. <laughs> um, next, we'll go to David Cron. Hi, Monica, just uh, very curious in your journey professionally and the evolution of your firm. I'm wondering what 
ways uh, traditional architectural firms can embrace a meaningful and impactful design process to help their communities, maybe also as a reflection of your comment about not necessarily uh, sustainable as pro bono. So I think there's a lot of different ways. I, th I think I was, I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day, a, a, a younger architect, and she was talking about um, me trying to make meaningful change, right? Like, like she's, she's, she's very much um, uh, working towards an engaged practice, a neighborhood-based practice, a social practice, and she works for a, a, a larger corporate firm. And we had a really good conversation about like, can you bring those values to the larger firm and educate and work with the, the architects and, and, and co colleagues and coworkers to build a broader conversation, right? Like one person in a large firm that is interested in, in social impact design can have a really huge impact that maybe a, 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 single, a solo practitioner may have a different kind of impact, right? So I think there's, there's ways to do it both ways. I think the other way is both through mentorship and then also supporting the project. So I, I do have friends who work in, in um, more traditional offices where again, they might help structure the, the beginnings of, right? Like, like a nonprofit or an organization is looking to get to the fundraising moment. So maybe there's services or support that's able to be offered at those beginning stages. I struggle a little bit with this because as we say it out loud, I'm like, I think it's great when larger firms can, can support um, organizations and nonprofits, but then I struggle because that's kind of our bread and butter, right? Like it's, it's the work that we do. Um, but I think that as firms recognize that they have an impact, like even the introduction, right? Like even, even the community and neighbors around you knowing that you're an architect or a designer and the kind of work you do is already a conversation, right? Like I, so many places that we've been as an office, like oftentimes we're like the first, you know, you're the first time I've ever talked to an architect or I, I didn't, you know, or maybe with, with someone younger, it's like, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize I could make a career of that. Um, so I think that, that, I think it starts with sort of mentoring probably a younger population as a starting point, and then also doing uh, work with, working with organizations to help start their journey, right? Working with a nonprofit at the beginning stages. So I don't know if that 100% answered your question, but, but I think both the mentorship and supporting nonprofits is, is the ways to go. Helpful advice, thank you. Monica, we have a question from Roberto Pinedo, I believe. Robert, can you ask that one? Sure. The question is, where to go? Um, what is the difference between equity in design versus equality in design? Um. I could be wrong, but the way I look at it is, I think equality presumes an even, giving an even playing field, right? Like I think equality is sometimes defined as like everybody gets the same thing, right? So like, you know, I, you get house A, you get house A, you get house A, right? And I've designed three house A's and that everything's equal. Equity might be like, oh, family A has, three kids and is supporting a college nephew and somebody's working two jobs. They need a bigger house in order to be supported the way they need to be supported. But you may, maybe family B is, is three people and could, could be in a smaller house, but still have the same needs met. So to me, equity is maybe meeting people where they're at, whereas equality is trying to like make it all the same. Okay, and I think we have one more. I do not, the name is BDT. There isn't a name, it's a set of initials. Hi, uh, Robert, this is uh, Nicholas Bittner with BDT, I appreciate it. Um, my question uh, for you, Monica, was more, how, how do you kind of balance or manage the multiple roles of you know, general contractor, designer, project manager? Um, based on kind of the size of your firm, is it kind of you wear all hats or you kind of trade off roles uh, with other team members? 
It's a bit of both. So I, I should be Chris, I should be super clear. So so the team you saw on the early slide is Civic Projects Architecture. Um, and that's our design team and our, our team that collaborates on all these projects. Um, the, the development entity, the general construct contracting and the property management are are other entities. So there's there's a different team that, that is doing those pieces. Um, so I, I wear several hats, but I, I made a decision in terms of the firm to not, we decided not to be design build, right? We decided that they would be two separate things. Um, got some amazing legal advice early on and we just thought that was the right practice for us. So we are wearing multiple hats in terms of trying to understand these points of views and trying to play these roles. But I am, when I'm on site, I'm on site more as an architect than I am as a general contractor. Uh, my husband's actually the general contractor for several of the projects I've been showing. And so he's wearing the general contractor's hat. I'm wearing the architect's hat. We're both developing and we're both quality control uh, and then work with an amazing group of subs to actualize the project. Oh, yeah. No, so it's more associated to, I think, a good strategy. I really appreciate it. Really wonderful work. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a much more associative connection. That's a, that's a good way to describe it. Monica, well, it helps a lot on the liability side. It, that, that, that's kind of the advice I got from my lawyer, right? It was like, you want to really think about this if this is what you're going to do. So the, the professional legal advice was keep them separate. But most Thank of those you. projects you do for yourself though, correct? So you're also the owner? The the residential projects that I'm talking about the with the general contracting and development, those are then for ourselves. So we actually hold on to those and that's where the property management comes in. We then we then rent those and, and manage those. So it is not all of our work by any stretch of the imagination, but that particular work we self-develop. Right. And we have a really loaded question coming up here by Eric Prose. So. Oh. Eric, you're muted. All right. Oh, he's got, he's having microphone issues. So I'll, I'll read his question. He said, fantastic work and excellent representation in your presentation. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Cleveland is on the verge of electing a new mayor. Now this is, this is in almost 20 years. We'll have a new mayor in 20, after a mayor of 20 years. Um, having worked throughout the Great Lakes region, what civic leadership initiatives have you seen work successfully what advice might you give to Northeastern Ohio civic leaders to initiate some of the, the successful projects you've worked on? You're right, that is a slightly loaded question. I think the, the best example or maybe the, the easiest one to point to might be the Invest Southwest initiative that's going on here in Chicago. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it, uh, some may not. But um, Invest Southwest is the initiative to, to it, there's a couple of aspects to that initiative. The, the impetus is to improve development and opportunities in South and West Side neighborhoods, which are the historically, um, historically have received less support uh, than, than North Side neighborhoods in Chicago. And, and the several mayors in Chicago are, have been part of the disinvestment kind of that's been ongoing. So possibly not dissimilar to some of the civic leadership you're talking about, but what Invest Southwest is trying to do is not just promote development and provide some funding in neighborhoods that have been underserved. It's actually partnering it with design excellence and partnering it with developers. Um, so Maurice, Commissioner Maurice Cox um, has set a series of 10 design excellence guidelines which every project needs to adhere to these 10 design excellence guidelines and also did uh, an outreach to have uh, the design community kind of pre-qualified, kind of pre -qualified. it's a bit of a loose term, but pre-qualified to work on these projects. So the idea is that here are quality firms that do quality work and achieve design excellence 
and you as a developer should try to partner with these firms, but you absolutely at minimum have to show the design excellence, the community wealth building, the integration with the neighborhood in order to be permitted to build the project, right? So the, the city is, is taking on that civic role of ensuring quality and good design in neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the methodology to that is that because of COVID, right, it's instead of public presentation, it's actually a series of eight minute videos. So we, we just participated in Best Southwest Bronzeville. There were three finalist developers with entire design teams. Each one produces an eight minute video in a public forum. And then both the presentation is live with Q&A. And then there is a very robust community impact community voting process that gives feedback. So the, the uh, stakeholders, community residents are all able to ask questions and get responses and also give their impressions and feedbacks on the presentation. So it's not just the city deciding by itself, it's actually with community input. So kind of a lot of things, but I would I would take a look at that Invest Southwest uh, initiative as as maybe a, a little starting point. We ha we have a a, quite a late arriving question. If we have some time, Kate Sarah Kleiner. Hello, thank you, Monica, for presenting here today. I appreciate it. Um, I seem to be following in your footsteps. I have a small architecture firm and I also have a development company. Both are about five years old and we are renovating our first mixed use building now. It will be 11 affordable apartments and our office space. So my question is, what advice do you have for me? Um, congratulations for starters. That sounds amazing, and and I, I love what you're doing. Um, so the your office and the so so you'll be housed, and there's 11 units all within one building. Yes. Okay, that sounds amazing. Um, is it a storefront type space then? Your office. Um, yes, it it used to be a carryout. So I actually think, I don't even think I need to give you any advice. I think you're absolutely in the right spot because you're putting yourself on a public street in a public, um, like by, by being a, the equivalent of a storefront space, right? Whether it was carry up or you're actually putting yourself on the ground where people are. So I actually think the kinds of conversations and dialogue you'll have the opportunity to engage in will actually build, build your practice, right? Will build your relationships in the neighborhood you're in. And obviously providing the housing is then also localized. So will you also manage it down the road, do you think? Or is it gonna be like a, a for sale or something? No, we'll be managing it. We'll be holding on to it. So I guess, so <laughs> most of my advice is keep doing what you're doing. It sounds amazing. Um, one little piece of advice that is tiny and I should have known better is don't give out your cell phone number. Um, it, it, it have a cell phone number, have to absolutely be accessible, but don't necessarily give out your personal cell phone number. Um, there's a long story behind that one, but um, I, I perseverance maybe is it, because there's probably a lot of people that are telling you it's really, really hard, or it's not gonna work, or it's gonna be hard to finance. And I would absolutely welcome you reaching out more with any kind of specific questions. Um, the, um, the, um, the, the ability to be flexible is probably the biggest thing you'll need. I'm sure you've seen things pivot and turn as you go along. So if, if you're armed with some flexibility, I think it's gonna be an incredibly successful project. Thank you. There's, there's no doubt we have to be very, very flexible. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. But do feel free to reach out, Sue. Thank you, I will. Well, Monica, I, I thank you again for your time, your your lecture and your projects and your approach were very insightful and uh, I feel more invigorated in what I do. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you hopefully the end of June when I'm in Chicago. So have a share a cup of coffee. Absolutely, if, if anyone comes here, I'll buy the coffee. We've got a great coffee shop downstairs. <laughs> That's great. And just a reminder, if you haven't filled out uh, for your HSW credits, there's a link in the chat box. 
and uh, hopefully we'll see you in a month on June 24th. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.